4. John chapter 4. I guess I'd have my notes if I, I would have stuck with that. John chapter 4, we are finishing up what we've called Faith Foundations, and uh, just looking at some of the things from Scripture that, things that we believe, why we believe it, right? Uh, and those things are helpful. It is not very helpful if we take a stand uh, about something and can't explain why. Anybody know anybody like that? You know, you know somebody like that? They take a stand for something but they have no clue why, or they don't actually take a stand. They just say they do. Much of Christian living is the same way. There are many of us who take a stand and say, well, we believe this. Here's one of my favorites. One of my favorites is the Christian who says, I, every word that God said, I follow. Great. You should, and then they turn around and don't. Like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You said this. You said right here, right? You, you, you get judgmental and a little bit condescending when you're talking to people about drinking because the Bible says we shouldn't drink. And then you turn around and you use the verse totally out of context that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Then you turn around and you throw nothing but fast food and fatty cakes in your body. I hate it. It's hypocritical. It's hypocritical. And so the reason that we step back and we, say, we look at these doctrines, right, some of these basic doctrines, is so that we are reminded, starting the new year, what we believe, why we believe it. Okay? What God says about it. Not to, we have not at all covered everything. But it is, we are wrapping it up. And for 2023, to prepare us for next week, for 2023, I believe that we need to understand who we are. I was speaking with a pastor friend this week, and uh, we were just talking and sharing some things, and, and uh, he said, you know, he said, I don't know what your stand is about, you know, church and outreach and all those things, he said, but, but I know that a lot of guys believe that the, the church is to focus on the church. And I was like, whoa, 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 let me stop you right there, brother. My job as the pastor is to tend to the flock. Amen. The flock. Now, it is the flock's job to go reach the lost. Jesus commanded in the Great Commission, or before he ascended back to the right hand of the Father, he commanded that we go into all the world and preach the gospel. Well, how do we go into all the world? Well, one, you've got to get out in it. Okay. Not being of it, that's Romans 12. We can go there if we need to. That's actually where we were going to be today until God changed about three minutes ago. So we're in the world, but we're not of the world, but we have to be out in it to reach the people that live there. Amen. Okay? And by the world, we mean the unsaved world. Okay? So go into all the world and preach the gospel. Well, that's a general command to everybody. That's not a command to the church. That's not a command to the pastor. It's a command to believers. Jesus was telling his disciples, hey, your job now, I have been the, I'm the light of the world. I'm in the world. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world, right? John, John 8, John 9, okay, which is where we're going to be next week, okay? As long as I'm in the world, I'm, a, I'm the light of the world. Now, he was speaking while he was physically in the world. But now, with his ascension, he's not physically in the world, but, but yet he is through us. And so he did command us to preach the gospel. So we have, as followers of Christ, we have the responsibility and command, if you really want to get nuts and bolts about it, we have the command from Christ himself who said, go take my message to everyone you meet. And I said, brother, we have to understand that the Great Commission is to Christians. It is not the pastor's job. Now, as, let, me, let me clarify that. As, as part of the church, as a believer, it is my job. 
So what are we really talking about? We're really talking about the responsibility of the church. That's really what we're talking about. What is the church's job? Well, pastor, you know, Lord's been good. We're supposed to come and we're supposed to have, eat together and have family game night and we're supposed to do this together and, and, and that together. And, and I agree with all of those things. We should spend time together. I believe we see that in the early chapters of Acts. I do believe it is biblical for us to gather. That's why I am so hard-headed on not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Okay? There is a reason that we gather together. But that's not just... The church is not a social club. Amen. The church is not a building. The church is a body of believers that God has set apart and placed in the world to share the message of the gospel. That, it's that easy. That's our role as a church. And I shared that with him, and he's like, you know, you know he's like, I, I know what you mean, and I understand what you mean. He's like, it's just so helpful. My role as the pastor is to the church. It, I am the conduit through which Christ speaks to his church. Now, that doesn't mean he doesn't speak to you one-on-one, -on -one, but to the church collectively or corporately, we may say. I'm just conduit by which he speaks. I also am the conduit by which the church collectively, corporately responds to the head. I am not the head of the church. Did you know that? I am not the head of the church. The pastor is not the head of the church. Christ is the head of the church. Christ, it is, you are his sheep. You belong to him. He paid for you. He bought you. He just placed me here to oversee you. That's it. I answer directly to the Lord. I answer directly to Christ because you're his. You belong to him. He paid for you. But he places men, yep, I said men, as pastors to oversee in his stead. Okay? He does. Now, so what does that mean for the church? Well, the church has a responsibility. Yes, we gather, we fellowship, we sing, and we listen to pre all of those things. Th those things are wonderful, okay? But when we talk about Christian living and our role from a basic foundational level, we must understand that our purpose is far greater than within these walls. Our purpose is the spreading of the gospel. That's what we're here for. We are here to boldly proclaim the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to read uh, John chapter 4. Let's see. Um, let's start in verse 31. Let's go to verse 31, John chapter 4. Verse 31. I'll give a little background after we're done reading. Verse 31, the Bible says, In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. So the disciples have come to Jesus, and uh, Jesus has been busy. And we'll unpack that in just a moment, because that's my favorite. It is my favorite one-on-one -on -one interaction that Jesus had during his earthly ministry. Disciples were sent to get food. They come back. They've got the food. In the meanwhile, the disciples prayed him, begged him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Speaking of spiritual food. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Did somebody bring him food? Jesus saith unto him, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors." And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, he told me all that I ever did. Father, we come to you this morning asking you to join us in a very special way. 
Lord, I ask that you would uh, speak through me, give me the wisdom and discernment to present your word in a way that would bring honor, honor to you, in a way that would glorify you, in a way that would be uh, uh, both uh, compassionate and uh, excited and, and filled with passion. Uh, Father, we thank you for the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Lord, we truly are unworthy and stand in awe this morning of how great you are and um, the fact that you would be willing to use us. Father, we ask that you would help us to be challenged. Lord, we ask that you would just speak to each and every one of us in a very special way through your word. We'll give you all the honor and all the glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So clearly, we, I think most of us in here likely understand Jesus and his disciples have been traveling. They are uh, coming to a region uh, that we refer to as Samaria. And the region of Samaria really kind of split the capital region of, of Israel, if you will, the area around Jerusalem, and the ga region of Galilee where Jesus' earthly ministry was, was mostly conducted. And so you had this big region there, okay, this big area. And um, the Samaritans, as many of you know, but, but for our visitors, for many of you, um, you would say, you know, the, the, <laughs> the Samarians were people who were looked at like less than dogs, okay? Dogs were pets in the New Testament. They weren't. I mean, they were there for work and to drive you crazy. They weren't pets. You didn't go buy them just so you could love on them. And cut. I mean, they took resources, right? They take resources to, to take care of and, and to care for, right? That's why when we got Eden a dog for Christmas, it was the understanding that daddy doesn't pay for it. I don't pay for nothing. Food, nope, 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 nope. I don't pay for food. I don't pay for shots. I don't pay for vet visits. I don't pay for anything. Now, if I want to go buy her a little toy or something for the backyard, well, I, I can do that, right? But, it's, but they take resources. So pets weren't in the, New Test, in the New Testament. They weren't seen. Dogs were not seen the way they are now. They were, they were scavengers. They were uh, nomadic. They were, I mean, occasionally they would be used for work, but they were just a tool. There's nothing special about them. They're, they're stinky. They go to the bathroom everywhere. They make a lot of racket. It's, it's horrible. It is a horrible situation. They're always in the way. Right? They eat garbage. They get into garbage. And that's how many of the Jews saw the Samaritans. The Samaritans widely accepted a biblical worldview. Many of them believed in the one true living God. But because they had, had bloodlines had been mixed, the Jews saw them as lower than the dog. Worse than dogs. People would go three to four days journey, um, uh, three to four days outside of their normal traveling path just to avoid the region of Samaria. And Jesus and his disciples are heading south and they're headed to, to Samaria. And uh, I, I picture it this way. Jesus said, I have knees, I must knees go through Samaria. Samaria. What he's saying is he's telling his disciples, hey, we're not going that way. We're going straight. There's a reason I need to go to Samaria. He didn't tell them why, okay? He didn't. He just said, I must needs. I have a need. I must get there. There is a specific reason and a specific purpose for me to travel into Samaria. Jesus arrives about the middle of the day, about lunchtime. Jesus arrives, and uh, he gets there, and, and he says, looks at his disciples. He says, hey, go into town, the Samaria proper, if you will, okay? Go into the town. And find us some food. I'm going to sit down here and get some water. And he sits down at what is often referred to as Jacob's well. Okay, And he sits down. And interestingly enough, a lady comes. She's alone. Which tells us that she likely was outcast. We learn a little bit later why she was an outcast. Okay, But it was not common for ladies to come number one, by themselves to fetch water for the day. Typically, they came in a group. So the fact that she's coming alone reveals to us that there's something odd about her, something strange about her, something different about her. 
Secondly, it was not normal to come at noon. It was hot. It's the desert. I've been in that part of the country. You don't do anything at noon except find shade. The last thing you would want to do is carry big old water pots. Water at 8.34 pounds a gallon will be heavy if you're grabbing enough water for that day. We think we're tough. Women in first century were not to be messed with. Tough. But she came by herself in the heat of the day. There's something peculiar about this lady. And so here she comes. Jesus is sitting there all by himself. <laughs> Disciples are going into town to find some victuals. She comes and he begins talking to her. Well, this is the third kind of ironic element. Because it was not common for a Jewish man to strike up a conversation with a Jewish woman. This is a culture where the women didn't walk next to men. They walked behind them. This is a culture where women were to take care of the home and the children and make sure that I had food to eat. That was the culture. You raise the kids, and when they get old enough, you get them learned and educated, then I'll take over and I teach them the family business. That was the relationship. So the fact that, a, that this Jewish man would engage conversation with this Samaritan woman, not just any woman, a Samaritan woman is very special, and it's why it's my favorite interaction that Jesus had one-on-one -on -one in all of his earthly ministry. Next to my one-on-one -on -one interaction with Christ, it is my favorite. So, we know how it goes. Right? She asks for water. He uses the, he, she asks if Jesus wants any water. He, she can tell he's hot, he's tired, he's thirsty. Uh, and he says, he starts using it as an opportunity to share the water that he provides. The living water. What is he doing? He's sharing the gospel with her. She believes. Now this wasn't, like I said, Samaritans widely accepted the one true living God, the God of the Bible. And so hearing of the arrival of the Messiah, Jesus basically saying, hey, look, it's me you've been waiting on. It's me that your fathers have taught and, and foretold of. It's me. I'm right here. I'm right here. In the flesh. One-on-one, -on -one, it's me. And she believed, didn't she? She trusted Christ as the Messiah, the Redeemer, the one who come for the propitiation of all man's sins. And then Jesus does something very exciting. And he says, go into the city and tell your husband. And she says, I don't have a husband. Jesus says, I know you've had five. And the one that you're with right now is not your husband. Now, was Jesus picking at her? I don't believe so. I don't think that's what we see in Scripture. And you can read the account in the other Gospels. I don't believe that's what we see. I don't at all. I believe Jesus used that to show her and just revalidate to her who he was. Because at that moment she went. We already read that the people of Samaria believed. And what did they believe? The testimony of the woman. Well, what was the testimony of this woman? This man knows everything about me. This man knows things about me that you ostracized me for. This man knows all of my mistakes, and I've never met him before a day in my life. I have grown up with you in this city, and you cast me out. All your wives, they don't want anything to do with me. That's why she was alone. That's why she went in the heat of the day, because the group of women went in the cool of the day, and she wasn't welcome. Why was she not welcome? Because she had made some choices in her life that really people didn't want to be around. It's kind of one of those, these situations. I say all the time, I, I, it, it drives me crazy. Being from Oklahoma, there's one thing that drives me nuts. In May, every year, as long as I can remember, in the month of May, Oklahoma shows up on the news all the time because of tornadoes. And newscasters go out and interview people. 
about the tornado. But they interview the 1% of Oklahoma's population that aren't educated. So then you, well, I was sitting there watching this tornado and on the front porch, and I was spitting in the, in the bucket, and when I looked up, it was right here. I didn't know what to do, and it took my house. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. You made all of us look like morons. <laughs> what am I getting at? Being a Samaritan was bad enough. And here it is. This woman is making it worse. Like, people don't like us because of ladies like you. Of course we're, we're not going to let you in, little group. Look, you, look, you're not taking care of your husband. You're not, look, we don't know if she had any kids, but you're not taking care of your husband. You've had five of them. We don't want anything to do with you. You're giving us a bad reputation. Just like when I tell people I'm from Oklahoma, they think I'm a redneck or trailer trash. They do. And most of our cultures are that way. Oh, you grew up in upstate New York. You're Catholic. It's the same way. Look, I'm not trying to be silly. I'm just trying to paint a picture here. That's what this woman was up against. She was ostracized. She was, she was viewed by her own people as somebody who was causing them to have a bad name. So it didn't help matters. But when the message of who Jesus was came to her, there was something that changed. There was something that happened. And what happened was she had a message now. She had a joy. She had a hope. She had a peace now. She had a new identity. Look, I'm not the woman that's living with some guy that's not my husband. I'm not the woman who's had five husbands. That's not me anymore. Look, I don't care about all that stuff because that stuff's gone. That stuff don't matter. That stuff's forgiven because I met Jesus. That's what her message was. I don't care if you think that I grew up in a trailer with a jacked up pickup, uh, walking around in cowboy boots and 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 hair and a ball cap and picking my teeth and walking around with big old straw hanging out my mouth. I don't care because that's not my identity. My identity is Jesus. Amen. So she goes and she tells. Well, after she leaves, we read in our text, the disciples come. Jesus, we got food. He's like, I'm good. <laughs> what? Think about this now. Do you, Jesus, do you understand? It is like 472 degrees out here. There's not one shade tree for us to stop. And if we did stop, you wouldn't have wanted us to stop because we're hungry. So we, we double time. We got into town. We grabbed some food. We've come back just like you told us to do. And now you, aren't, you don't want to eat. I'd be upset. I would. I would be upset. Wouldn't you? Yeah. Somebody was honest. Two of us honest in the whole room. I'd be upset. <laughs> Lord, wait a minute. <laughs> Look, I, what do you mean? What do you mean? You sent us. You know, I wonder, I don't think it ever dawned on the disciples that he needed them out of the way. Because here's what happens a lot of time. When we're trying to share the gospel with somebody, we're sitting there and people are in the way and they like to jump in and they like to run their mouth. The world does it all the time. We go out and we knock on somebody's door, they open the door, we're, and, and nobody's around. But as soon as you say, can I ask you a spiritual question? They come out of the woodwork. So what was Jesus doing? Removing the distraction. It's all about me. You guys go get some food, I'll eat later. He was removing the distraction. He was just getting them out of the way, removing the noise. Look, this world's loud enough. The last thing we need to do is people being like, Jesus, we're hungry. Come on. Look, she's a Samaritan woman. She's like, she's not, look, she's by herself. Like, there's something up with this woman. Can we go eat? What am I getting at? Jesus doesn't pass anybody up. We do. We look at people. We pass people up. We look at somebody who we see is lower than the dogs. I'm not saying literal, quote, unquote. That's the whole quote thing, okay? We see somebody that we don't think is worth our time, and we just head on into town. Or we go all the way out of our way to avoid them. Have you ever done this? I, I've seen it. I've seen it. And I've probably been guilty of it at some point. I'm not glorifying that. I'm just saying. 
you're walking down the street, you got tracks in your hand, you go up to this door, you knock, whatever, nobody comes out, and you get flowing. You come back out to the sidewalk, and you're going along, and you see somebody coming, and you're like, man, where was I supposed to, you know, I don't remember, and they pass you. I wonder how many of us live our lives that way. We see somebody coming at us who we know needs the gospel because Jesus said go into all the world and preach the gospel, not just the ones that you pick and choose. But we do that, don't we? We live our lives in such a way that we're picking and choosing. We had a, I had a drill instructor. So when I first joined the military, I went, I went in the Navy. And we were at boot camp, right? I was at boot camps in the 90s. And we're marching along. And I had a, a drill instructor. He was uh, one of those old school sailors, grew up in the 80s. Like one of the, he put his hands on you. Rough, rough, tall, skinny, grew up in Atlanta like he's just hardcore guy, right? He had been in like, I don't know, 150 years. And he, so at, at, at East, in the, in the Navy, when you've been in 12 years with good conduct, you get gold rank on your dress uniform. Well, when, at graduation, his rank was red, and he'd been in for like 17 years. That means he was just always in trouble. He was one of those guys. So he's, he would, we would be marching, right? We'd be marching, and he would, do, he would see an officer coming, and he would do this. Left, 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 right, 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 left, right. Why was he doing it? He didn't want to salute. He's like, I'm better than that guy. I ain't saluting that 22-year-old ensign. Some of you, it's clicking. I'm just waiting on everybody else to connect the two dots. Jesus doesn't do that. We do. Jesus was removing the distractions. He's like, man, if I go and try to talk to this lady, one, the disciples are going to sit there and be belly aching about how hungry they are. And two, it's not going to make sense why I'm spending time talking to not only a Samaritan, but a Samaritan woman. And not only a Samaritan woman, when they find out that this woman's been married five times and, and the guy she's with now isn't even her husband, like, they're going to lose their mind. So I'm just going to remove the distraction. We need to be that way. We need to remove that distraction. We need to get the distraction out of the way. If God is going to work, if Christ is going to transform lives, we must let him work and get out of the stinking way. Amen. Why don't you just go get something to eat? But here, there's something else that we can learn from that. He sent them to get food. But he's the bread of life. You see, they had different needs. The disciples and the woman had totally different needs. Which brings us to our main text. You're like, Pastor, that you have need. Look, I told you I don't have an outline, so pray for me. <laughs> Look, I ain't got nothing up here, I'm telling you. Okay? My bookmarker's in Romans 12. But he said unto them, speaking to the disciples, verse 32, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. He said, look, I've got something going on. I've got something that's more fulfilling to me. You're focused on the actual food. You're focused on sustenance. You're focused on those things that only temporarily provide and temporarily cure, temporarily meet needs that are only met temporarily. What you're focusing on is temporary. What my meat, what I eat, what fills me, you don't have a clue. That's where the problem was at. And I wonder how many of us at Heritage Baptist Church as we enter into 2023 are the disciples. I wonder how many of us Christians, period, I don't care where you, where, what body God has placed people in, but as true born-again believers, I wonder how many of us are focused on the temporary things that, that, that satisfy our temporary needs. Well, I'm hungry. So we'll go get food. What Jesus is speaking about to his disciples is those temporary things. And he's like, hey guys, you're missing it. Stop focusing on the temporary. Christians, we've got to stop focusing on that promotion at work. If God wants it, if we're working for the Lord and not working for the manager, 
Don't you think God's going to work out that promotion if He wants us to have it? Amen. We need to stop working to buy that brand new car. Look, I'm all for a brand new car. I'd like one. But that's not what we're working towards. We work to provide a testimony into a community, into a world that needs us. Amen. We are working in that job to provide for temporary needs. The things that of this life, the things of this world that we can't take with us. The things that really, truly, in all of eternity don't matter. That's what that job's for. We're working and we spend all this time and effort on our kids and making sure that they can do this event and that event and this event and that event. Look, I don't care if your child is a pro athlete one day. You can't. There's no pro sports teams in heaven. Who cares? Well, Pastor, you're just saying that. I was good enough. I was good enough. I'm a six-foot-tall white guy and got recruited to play college basketball. May not sound a whole lot, but if you were ba ever around basketball, that's huge. But that's a temporary thing. That's for this life. But what, the, what we're saying, what Jesus is revealing here, is our lives are not about this life. Amen. Our lives are not for the temporary things. Amen. Yeah, that promotion at work gives me a new car, but there's no trailer hitch on a hearse, as Brother Xavier says. can't take it with me that being one of the greatest experiences of my life was being recruited to play college ball and I wasn't recruited by them big schools I, I could have been their equipment manager but it's a big jump from high school to basketball and the greatest percentage of high school basketball players don't get are not good enough to play college so when you have any college scout come to, I don't care how big or how small that school is, you're different. There's something about you. You're different. You can throw down. You can play ball. That's a big deal. You're part of like 3% of all high schools. 3%. That's a big deal. But that's something for this life. Buying that new house. I, I'm all for a new house. I would love a new house. My house is paid for. If you know what I'm talking about, then you know that you can laugh. If you don't, I live on the property. Okay? I'm thankful that we have a roof over our head and the bills are paid, and I'm thankful that the church does that. But I'd like my own roof. I'd like my own walls. I would like my own grass. I would, I would, li I would. I would love that. I, I've never had, buy, had my own home. I would love that. But the, that's not what I'm working for. What I'm working for is, is, is to be here and do this morning what I'm doing this morning. P plugging in and feeding. That's what I'm doing as an under-shepherd this morning. That's what I'm doing is I'm just feeding. I'm grabbing the grain and just casting it out there. Are your mouths open? Are you picking it up? Are you eating it? The problem was is that the disciples were thinking about the physical that moment, those temporary things that only temporary things can, can, can cure. Jesus is talking about an eternal fulfillment. Amen. And he says, the meat that I have, you know not of. Therefore, and because of that, said the disciples one to another, has any man brought him any food? Ah, how irritating would this be if you were Jesus? For them to... <laughs> Come up here with me for a minute, Cecil. Just for a minute. So me and Cecil, we're the disciples, right? We're hot. We're tired. We're sweaty. We got food. And we come up to Jesus. We can't let Brother Xavier be Jesus because he'll get all excited. But we come up to Jesus. We're like, hey, we got this food for you. And he goes, hey, the meat that I have, you know not of. Did he eat? Like they totally disregarded what Jesus just said. Looked at each other. Did he eat already? <laughs> Thanks, buddy. It doesn't brief as well if I don't look at somebody, right? But that's what the disciples did. They didn't even listen. Jesus just got done trying to help them understand, and they went, somebody bring him food. We laugh. We laugh, but you're not going to laugh in a minute because we do that in our lives as well.
We have preachers. We have pastor, guest preachers, our staff guys. We have Sunday school teachers. We have our own devotion time. Time and time and time and time and time and time again, we are told and we are taught and we are shared from God's Word what the expectation is for us as Christians. And we turn around and go, so, so I can't buy a new car? It's easy to look at the disciples and laugh that Jesus is trying to teach them something and they turn around and look at each other like Brother Cecil and I did, a couple of idiots. I know that's how we look. He already ate. We do. <laughs> Gee, yeah. We do that. We get so focused on the temporary. We get so focused on what makes us feel good. We get so wrapped up in what we want to do and how we want to do it. Pastor, I'll go to church, but I'm only going to go to church if I don't have better things to do. Well, what did you just say? You're lucky you have a life. You're lucky you're not dying and going to hell. Amen. And you want to do what you want to do. Well, I'll be there if I ain't got better stuff to do. Well, preacher, you don't understand. Like we have church, the times that we have church is the only time I can do my laundry. Call me. I'll come over and help you do your laundry. We've got to stop being Christians. I don't mean we heritage. I mean all Christians. And I said the word we. We've got to stop thinking what the Bible says is about temporary needs. We've got to transition to heritage. We have to live in 2023 looking at eternal. Not worried about the temporal. Not worried about things of this life. Not worried about whether or not I've eaten today, but whether or not I have supped with the Lord today. Amen. That's what we have to do. That's how we have to live. We've got to get over ourselves and focus on Christ. Amen. We have to. It is clear. Evidence is yesterday. CJ's sitting here. CJ, stand up for a minute. CJ's one that trusted Christ yesterday. How would, thanks buddy, you can sit down. How would, how would he hear without a preacher? How would he have heard if the person that talked to him and, and told him about Jesus had to do some shopping yesterday? Say, ah, you know, I really gotta, I really need to run these errands. Millie's not feeling well. I'm just gonna run these errands. It's okay. She's not feeling well, and so we'll I'll come by next week. What would have happened? What would have happened? CJ likely would not be sitting here today, but more importantly, because sitting here today is a temporal thing, but more importantly, he could have missed his opportunity. He could have missed it. If we are given the opportunity to share the gospel and we don't, do you realize that might have been their only chance? What if God came to you, Brother Xavier, and led you to that one person walking down the street? You see him. And, and the Holy Spirit says, there's, a, there's an opportunity. You just missed it. You just missed it. Why'd you miss it? Because you were worried about the temporal. You were worried about the here and now. You were worried about those things right now. And right now, you didn't want to. Right now, you were full of doubt. Right now, you were in a hurry. You have places to be. Right now, you were on your way to pick the kids up from school. And we need to pick our kids up from school. We should never leave our kids with the teacher, okay? That's just rude, okay? But do you not think that if we stop and we just do what the Holy Spirit of God has led us to do, you not think He'll work the rest of it out? He does that all the time. I was so upset. I had a migraine yesterday. I called Brother Mike. He was going to make a couple visits with me. And I called him up and I said, brother, I, or I texted him. I said, brother, I'm sorry, I'm getting a migraine. There's no way I can be out. No way. I know what the sun's going to do. And it was sunshiny yesterday. I was like, I just, the reading and I've just, I've got a migraine. 
And he said, no problem, I'll make the visits. And then he calls me, tells me about Georgette. Lady at Albany Med had talked to Miss Leah, knows Miss Leah. Miss Leah had texted me. So I had set up to go with Brother Mike because we were going to go up there and see somebody else anyways. You know, I felt about this big for a migraine. Not being there for a migraine because Georgette trusted Christ as her Savior yesterday. I felt about this big. I said, Lord, I... He said, I don't need you. Paul, your migraine could have been a distraction. You might not have been willing to sit there and talk to her as long as was necessary because your head hurt. But God doesn't need me. He needs willing hearts. He needs people who are willing to go. He needs people who are willing to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. I would have loved to have been there. But I know myself when I get a migraine. I cannot focus. I can't. I can't think. I can't. There's no. I, I probably said something foolish. But God knew. And I think it's okay that I felt bad for not being able to go. I wanted to be there. And then she gets saved on top of it. Ah! <laughs> but we still get to be a part of that. My point is simply this. We have to be willing. We have to think about the spiritual. We have to think about the eternal. And then Jesus goes on to explain why. Very common passage of Scripture. But this is where I, what I want to leave you with, okay? So he said, look, therefore said the disciples, verse 33, one to another, hath he, any man brought him something to eat? And look what Jesus does. So Jesus hears them. And he says, hey, my meat, what fills me up, what, what provides me with sustenance, what keeps me going, is to do the will of Him that sent me and to finish His work. That is what I need. That's what I desire. I can eat later. I can, I can eat when we leave this place. We can stop off at Burger King on the way home. But I need to be a part of the Father's work. I need to do the things that He's called me, commanded me to do. Amen. Yeah, Jesus was commanded. He was commanded to be about the Father's work. And then He says... Let me ask you something. Say not ye. That's. Let me ask you something. Or don't you say. Say not ye. There are yet four months. And then cometh harvest. What is Jesus saying? He's saying. Isn't it like us. To look out on the fields and say. A few more months. And they'll be ready. What's Jesus say. At the end of that. In the second part of that verse. They're already ready. But you're so worried about the here and now. You're so worried about the things that give you pleasure today. You're so worried about those things that you can't take with you into eternity that you don't even realize the fields are already white under harvest. They're there. If we don't take it now, it'll die and go away. When the fields got to a place where they were white already under harvest, that was it. It was the last possible opportunity to harvest the crop. <laughs> any later, and it would be rotted. That's what Jesus is doing. He's saying, look, you guys are wrapped up in all this temporal here and now stuff. Stop thinking about the here and now. Do we need to be good stewards of our job? Yes. Do we need to be good, work hard and, and try to get promoted? Yes, I believe we do. do is, it, is there anything wrong with working and saving up for a new vehicle? No, there's not. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is living for those things. Investing all of your time and energy into a dream and, and into a hope that, that maybe is not part of God's plan for you. <coughs> well, Pastor, you know, I've, just, I've always wanted. Yeah, there's stuff I've always wanted too. I understand. 
And what God, what's God want? Well, Pastor, we gotta, we got to think about those things. I mean, that's how we pay the bills. You're right. It is how we pay the bills. But God's going to make sure you can pay the bills. Jesus is just simply saying, stop thinking about the here and now. we got to start thinking. We need a different set of eyes. We need to stop looking out at the world around us, saying, what can I get from the world? How can I do that? Looks fun over there. How can I bring that in? Oh, wait a minute. That looks pretty good over there. I could bring some of that in. And as long as I'm not doing that, as long as I'm not doing that, as long as I'm, as long as I'm you know, working it and making it flow, like, like I could be a part of that. No, 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 no. That's not what Paul told the Romans in Romans chapter 12. Be, in the, be, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. Be turned into something entirely different. We have to be turned into something entirely different. The disciples in uh, John chapter 4 needed to be turned into combines. You know what combine is? See, I'm from, I'm from out west. <laughs> Wheat fields of Oklahoma. Combine is a big, big, you know, old school like lawnmowers, they just, the rotary blade on it, and it just, right? Combines are as wide as this room and about yay tall. They're about four or five feet tall in diameter, and they just chop the crop, but they separate it. He was telling the, the disciples, you need to be a combine. You need to get out there before it rots, but you're trying to figure out what you can do until the harvest is ready. You're missing it. Church, we've got to stop living for today. We've got to start living for the future, the Lord's return. There is coming a day where He will return in the clouds, the trumpet will sound, and we will be gone, gathered up. We must prepare for that day. Your promotion at work doesn't matter. The new car doesn't matter. The new house doesn't matter. What matters is the souls on the street that you're passing. Well, Pastor, how do I know if they're ready? The Holy Spirit! Amen. Stop complicating it. Well, Pastor, you just don't understand. No, I do understand. I do. You're worried about the now. You're worried about the here and now. But you've been transformed. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You're someone new. You don't think the way you used to think. You're able to think a new way. Well, how do we think new? His ways become our ways. How do we let that happen? How does that transformation take place? By the renewing of your mind. <coughs> when our mind, our mind comes into play, when we see the situation and begin to develop a course of action or plan, that's the role that our mind makes. If I want to lose weight, I will use my mind to formulate a process whereby I reduce that weight. Right? So when it comes to transformation, we have to let Christ rewire our brains so that we see what He sees. And that's what He was telling the disciples. Look, this field's all right. You need to see it through my eyes. You need to see what I see when I look out. I don't see a harvest that we've got four months to wait on. You do. You see it as something four months off. But I don't see it four months. Like, you missed it. I guess today. Church, we got to share the gospel with a sense of urgency. Amen. We've got to. Amen. We've got to share the gospel with a sense of urgency. Pastor, how does this relate to, like, foundations of our faith? Because here at Heritage Baptist Church, we believe in soul winning. Amen. Not soul saving, soul winning. Amen. We go out and we reach them and we talk to them. It, it's, it's, it's a command. This is a non-negotiable with the Lord. I've often wondered if we experience the blessings of two souls being saved when just a handful of people go out I wonder what it would look like if we all said you know what I need to get out and harvest because this field's going to rot 
Wonder what we'd see God do then. A couple people get saved because of a handful of folks. Wonder how many would get saved because of an entire body. If an entire body caught the vision, how exciting would that be? Church, the field is white. It's white. If we're not in it, it's going to rot. And I will tell you this, if you can't see the decay setting in, you're just not paying attention. Look, sin causes decay. It caused the life-giving property of, of the crop to break down. But when we start thinking about souls as a crop, we'll under, we will understand that God gave them life, breathed life into them for one purpose, to have a relationship with them. So my question to you is this, as Brother Dale makes his way to the organ, my question to you is this, are you watching the crop rot? Or are you grabbing a sickle, sword, and chopping it down? You grabbing the sword and going out there to harvest? Or are you letting it rot? Let's all stand together with our heads bowed and our eyes closed.